the Civil War, the West is already legendary. It is looked upon as the frontier rather than the great American desert, an empty land awaiting settlement and civilization, a place for fresh beginnings and bold undertakings. The great myth makers of the Old West, uh, people like uh, Frederick Remington uh, in art, uh, people like Owen Wister, in literature, the author of the Virginian, uh, academics uh, like Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, these, uh, these myth makers um, had most of their impact, I think, in the 20th century, rather than at the time of the settlement of the West itself, or the, of the Western frontier itself. Their great impact was on those of us in the 20th century who look back on that time and would like to sort of recapture it in one way or another. Whereas Turner celebrated the pioneer advance across the continent as the centerpiece of the making of an American society. The new Western historians have tended to invert the story, to pay far more attention, deservedly so, to the casualties that accompanied American expansion, to the environmental and human and cultural costs associated with that expansionism, to put more attention on Indians, on ethnic minorities, and on women the expansion that transforms the Far West and its economy begins in the mid-19th century with the arrival of the miners. In the case of both gold and silver mines, sometimes these boons were quite short-lived, uh, only a matter of uh, months or even weeks. The richest silver deposits generally tended to last longer. Probably the best example of this, of course, is the Comstock Road in Nevada, on the eastern slopes of the Sierra Nevada. Over time, uh, the Comstock produced something in the neighborhood of $300 million in silver, and it was uh, by far uh, the richest uh, paying mining area in the world of its day. A second major economic surge occurs with the emergence of the cattle kingdom. There was a shortage of supply of beef in the Northeast, because, primarily because of the Civil War. So much of it had been used to feed the Union armies. There was a great supply of beef, probably somewhere between two and three million head of these cattle in southern Texas. Because there was a great deal of supply there and very little demand, the market price of these cattle was virtually nothing, maybe five dollars a head, if you could somehow magically move that same animal uh, from southern Texas up to the Ohio Valley to Cincinnati or to New York, you could get anywhere from 25 to 35 dollars a head. The trick was, how do you bring those two things together? You need trains to begin to move minerals, to begin to move cattle, to begin to move wheat, to begin to do all the things that the West can produce, but there was no way to get it to market until the railroads come in. The railroads, in effect, begin to change everything. And they change it so quickly that it astonishes people. And beginning in 1867, the first herds of cattle were driven northward out of southern Texas, up along those famous uh, cattle trails, like the Chisholm Trail, up into Kansas, first to the town of Abilene, uh, where they made connection uh, with the railroad, loaded on those uh, cattle cars, and sent back to the east for slaughter. But like the mining industry, the early economic success of cattle ranchers is difficult to sustain. A lot of people got into it, and within a few years, the prices of cattle began to fluctuate rather dramatically. Luckily, this coincided uh, with the beginnings of the spread of ranching northward out of Texas out of the uh, southwest, onto the Great Plains, eventually all the way up into the Northern Plains and into Canada. And so this was an alternate market uh, for those cattle. This was the greatest and most rapid spread of domesticated animals in the history of the world. 
The life of the cowboy also becomes part of the legend of the West, although not all of it is quite as it is portrayed. You think of a cowboy as being self-reliant. Certainly, in many ways, he had to be. You think of a cowboy as being uh, tough, and it is very difficult for <laughs> anyone who's ever tried to do it. So those elements of the, of the myth of the cowboy, the legend of the cowboy, are certainly, certainly based in reality. It should also be kept in mind that the cowboy was working for someone else. He was not independent in that sense. He wasn't working for very good money. It still isn't. These were difficult, dirty, monotonous jobs. The great majority of cowboys who went with the herds up the cattle trail uh, on these cattle drives only did it once. <laughs> they considered among the most miserable experiences of their lives. <laughs> uh, so I think that is one way to remind ourselves about the tarnished side, let's say, of this cowboy legend. Another part of the legend is that cowboys were naturally raucous when these cowboys came into the cattle town at the end of the cattle town, when they came into Dodge City or rode into Abilene. There was a great deal of drinking, a great deal of hanging out in bordellos, a great deal of gambling, of fighting. They were under an iron control with a boss uh, and suddenly had money in their pockets and a chance to, uh, a chance to be on their own. Does it naturally follow that the West is a dangerous place to be in the late 1800s? The kinds of violence that are central to this Western legend, the shootouts in the middle of the street, are far less common than legend would have. A study of cattle towns in, in Kansas, for example, show in the neighborhood of one homicide annually. So those, uh, those sort of mythicized forms of violence uh, were not nearly as common, nearly as frequent uh, as we think. Other types of violence, however, do occur. For example, the assaults on Indians in the mining areas of, of California, the violence against other ethnic groups, against Hispanics in the Southwest, the violence against Chinese in California, and in places like Wyoming, the violence of capital against labor, the union busting in these uh, mining areas, in the load mining areas, a great deal of what we might call uh, social or ethnic violence. That, I think, is what we need to pay more attention to as historians rather than uh, the kinds of shootouts on Main Street at high noon uh, that are part of the popular lore. Given their image of the West as virgin territory awaiting the civilizing influence of white settlers, newcomers seem somewhat surprised that Native Americans have a different point of view. The relationship between the United States and Indian peoples is in some ways an argument. Because the United States, if you look only at the West, has what might be accounted the um, best record towards Indians of any nation in the Western Hemisphere. I think Blind Deloria in one of his books even, even says this. And the reason you can say it is because legally the United States recognizes Indian peoples as semi-sovereign nations who own the land until it's ceded to the United States, who have a set of basic rights which cannot be taken away from them by the United States, and so that they're given a whole set of legal protections. And then you have the United States attempt at certain times to subvert it when it gets in their way. And both things go on at once. So there's this constant tension. One of the most dramatic examples of this tension occurs in Idaho in 1877. For decades, members of the Nez Perce tribe have been living quietly and peacefully in Oregon. After the Little Bighorn took place and the, the killing of Custer's soldiers, a demand went out throughout the West to take all non-reservation Indians and force them onto the reservation. In the Northwest, General Howard receives orders to force the Nez Perce onto reservations. The tribe resists, as the medicine man explains. The earth was sacred to them, that it held the bones of their ancestors, that they could not surrender it, and that they had made no agreement. That white people made these agreements, that they divided up the land in such a way, but the Indians had not done it. Finally, Howard became angry and threatened Chief Joseph and all the various leaders. He pointed to them and said, will you go to the reservation or will we fight? And every one of them agreed that they would have to go to the reservation. Then years later, Chief Joseph said uh, of that day, he said, um, we were like the deer and he was the grizzly bear. We had to agree. So they went back to their villages and prepared to get ready to move to this uh, smaller parcel of land. But when they did, some young men, uh, Walitas, killed a few white men who had been doing harm and harassing Indian people. 
and then a few more people were killed and it triggered the Nez Perce War. The tribe's leader, Chief Joseph, convinces his followers to run from the retribution that is sure to come. As Chief Joseph flees towards Canada, you already have the tourist west developing. And, he, and he's leading the Nez Perce through Yellowstone National Park. And among the people he captures turns out to be these tourists who just wandered through to see the new national park, to see the wonders of Yellowstone. And what they blunder into is really the last of the Indian Wars. And I think, who, who knows who's more surprised. Um, they are all the way uh, up to the Canadian border, and they are stopped there by Colonel Miles. Then the people negotiate a settlement in which they were to return to uh, Idaho, but instead they're put on flatboats and taken down to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and then into the Indian Territory of Oklahoma. But when they came back, some of them were forced to go to, to the Colville Reservation, not the Nez Perce Reservation, and Chief Joseph died on the Colville Reservation up in the northern part of Washington. Sporadic fighting between whites and Indians continues as Indians struggle to maintain the remnants of their civilization. In the United States, the American Indian policy is never genocidal in the sense that what it's aimed at doing is eliminating Indian population. The fear of Americans is that in fact the Indian population will disappear and that somehow there's going to be a blot on the Republic. They certainly want Indians as, as distinctive cultural members to, to disappear, but they want them to choose to do so. When Indians are not eager enough to do this, the United States will apply great coercive pressure to get them to do it, from um, Indian schools, taking children away, banning religion. So at the same time, again, you have this sense of wanting consent, of you will assimilate, but if you don't assimilate, we apply this incredible force. The stated goal of American Indian policy was to integrate Indian peoples into the national mainstream. That meant making them farmers, farmers of a particular sort, uh, farmers of the Jeffersonian model, uh, being reasonably self-sufficient, but at the same time contributing to a national and international market. That had always been the goal, the official goal of the government. By the late 19th century, as the West began to fill up with European Americans, then uh, there was greater and greater pressure to open Indian land. It's those two developments that converge in what was called the Dawes Act of 1887. So what the Dawes Act said basically was this, that each tribe would draw tribal roles draw the list of persons who belong to that tribe. Reservation land would be surveyed, and each family and each individual would be given a kind of a homestead. Each of these parcels of land uh, would be um, held in trust for 25 years. That is, the Indians would not be allowed to sell them. This is to supposedly to prevent people from coming in and, and persuading them to sell them uh, for much less than they were worth. The tribes had difficulty just surviving because they were renegades if they moved off of the reservation to go hunt or fish or gather. And so the United States established a system of rations, of providing uh, ration days for Indian people to line up. And, and we have uh, wonderful photographs showing ration day, of bringing cattle in and then butchering the cattle and then throwing different uh, elements of the animal, like the insides of the animals, out the back window and women there with big buckets and pails to gather the inside parts of the animal. They needed to use every part of it. The, the horns were ground up and used in, in food as well. That uh, the United States created a situation in which Indians could not feed themselves because they couldn't get to their foods. The Dawes Act itself is not considered a success, either by Native Americans or the government. In fact, it turned out to be more or less a disaster because uh, of poor administration, uh, because of corruption. In many cases, Indian people were given the worst of the land. Many refused to cooperate, uh, signing up on the rolls. They wanted to hold on this land, of course, communally. They wanted to, to keep it in the way that they always had. They considered this a collective, a collective possession of them as a, as a people, not to be divvied up, not to be divided up and given to individuals. And so they simply refused to cooperate. That meant that if they were not on the rolls, they didn't get any land. The land was still divided and given away. They were now just out of it, at a loss. The arrival of the miners, the empire building of the cattle ranchers, the dispersal of the Indian tribes, all serve as a prelude to a massive movement of farmers into the Plains region. More land was brought under cultivation in the United States between 1870 and 1900 than in all of American colonial history prior to that. 
the most dramatic growth came uh, on the eastern Great Plains, where this agricultural economy that was so well developed in the American Midwest spread across the Mississippi River, across the Missouri River, into uh, Kansas and Nebraska, into South Dakota, into Iowa, into those regions. The beginning of cultivation of grains. Uh, but farming was also booming elsewhere throughout the West during these years. It was booming in the interior West in areas that were developed to feed these new centers of population, the mining towns. It was developing in Utah around Salt Lake. It was booming in California. It was developing in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. So agriculture was developing in many different parts of the West, uh, developed very rapidly uh, with the aid of um, the new technology, the uh, new technology of agriculture, and of course the aid of the railroad. Just a few years earlier, such rapid agricultural growth would have seemed unlikely. Lots of the soldiers who fought in the Indian Wars of the 1870s and 80s wrote home and they asked, we don't know why we're fighting this war. This land is not going to be land that anyone is going to want. Americans were used to evaluating the quality of land based on the quality of trees that grew upon it, which is not an accurate way of understanding the fertility of soils, but the Great Plains had no trees on it. And so it was called by an early expedition, the Great American Desert, and that term remained on maps of the United States well into the 19th century. So the interior far west has an environment that is one of the most unpredictable and erratic in the Western Hemisphere, for example, in an area of the plains that has an average annual rainfall of 15 inches. That might mean 20 or 22 inches one year, and it might mean seven inches the next. A fair risk of business. During the early years of this great agricultural boom on the plains, the plains went through one of its uh, periodic wet cycles. So, by good luck, uh, it rained a good bit more than usual. People began to farmstead on this land they were given generous grants of land on either side of the railroad tracks, in fact, 10 miles in a checkerboard pattern on either side of their right of way was granted to them by Congress. And in order to sell it to farmers, they participated in one of the great deceptions of American land history, which was that essentially rain would follow the plow. It may look droughty to you, settler, but in fact, once you put in your crops, the climate itself will change as an out and out lie. And so consequently, they began to overcommit themselves so to farming in this region. And then in the 1890s, the hammer came down. The rainfall stopped. The drought came. And when that happened, uh, the result was economic and human disaster. Farm life on the Great Plains is different than farming in the Midwest or points east. They built sod houses, literally these mud huts, in which they cut bricks out of the sod. Or you could also burn it for fuel. They had to develop, for example, new types of plows, steel-tipped plows of a certain shape that would cut through the sod more easily. Barbed bar wire uh, that was developed in the 1870s uh, in Illinois, you know, a cheap and practical device to keep animals, uh, grazing animals like cattle uh, and horses, out of certain areas, especially away from uh, crops uh, and away from certain water sources. So uh, millions and millions of pounds of barbed wire uh, begin to be produced almost overnight. Barbed wire conjures up yet another image from tales of the Old West, the hostility that is said to exist between farmers and cattle ranchers. There was to some degree a natural competition between um, farmers and cattle, and for obvious reasons. Those are two very different ways uh, to use what was, after all, one at the same time, one of the great natural pastures on the planet, and also some of the richest soil uh, on Earth. In some ways, however, that competition is a little overdone. Uh, the Great Plains is best understood as a mixture of these two economies uh, during these years. And furthermore, there, if you look at the Plains as a whole, you'll see that, that um, there is a fairly clear division of how that land could be used. Toward the west is an area where only ranching makes sense. Farther to the east, where there's more rain, it really makes more sense to farm that area. So the conflict really, I think, is somewhat exaggerated. By the late 19th century, American farming no longer resembles the comfortable image of independent farm families. In many cases, they've been replaced by the commercial farmer, who attempts to do in the West what industrialists are doing in the manufacturing economy. The countryside that took shape in California 
at the beginning might have looked like any place of settlement uh, in the far west or in the midwest. People came in, they organized small farms, generally of mixed crops and livestock. By the 1860s, capitalists, people who had never been farmers, or people who certainly had never farmed on a large scale, came to the San Joaquin Valley and they organized wheat fields on a truly remarkable scale. It was called bonanza wheat farming, that word meaning sky high or blue sky. These are wheat fields that were simply larger than anything anyone had seen before. Cattle, beef, oxen, these animals are required an enormous amount of feed. They could eat natural forage to a point, uh, but they had to be supplemented with grains that were grown in the field, and also hay. These commercial activities alter the look and feel of traditional agriculture. It used a new breed of machinery that had been invented in California. Gang plows that would have 10, 20 horses pulling each one. Obviously, this required groups of men, homeless, migratory men, to harvest these crops. It took them a month, in some cases, to do this camping, sleeping, eating in the field, sort of like the way that cowboys would move from Texas up to the railheads in Kansas, eating and sleeping along the way. This wheat, once harvested, went to the wharves in San Francisco, was loaded into some of the same ships that brought miners, and it was then carried around the Cape, and then ultimately to Liverpool, England, which was its destination. There had never been a trade in an agricultural commodity that had gone this distance before. And it was undertaken by capitalists who were extraordinarily bold, who conducted this with very little insurance, but simply depended upon the economies that they realized in the production of the crop, the fact that the land was virtually uh, free for the taking, the fact that they were never going to restore this land, and the fact that labor and transportation were relatively inexpensive. Worldwide overproduction leads to a drop in prices for most agricultural products in the late 1880s. Farm families are painfully aware that something is wrong. But instead of blaming the glut of products on the market, they blame the railroad, the banks, and the government. By the late 1880s and the early 1890s, the discontent among American farmers, especially on the Great Plains and in parts of the South, uh, was rising to, um, uh, to an extraordinary uh, pitch. The basic cause was uh, that the price of the things that they were growing were declining. And they were not able then to, uh, to make enough money to pay their mortgages, uh, to support themselves, to, um, in some cases, to, to feed their families. In the first place, paradoxically, the farmers were suffering partly from their own success. The increase in the production was so great during these years that it simply outpaced the demand for those products. At the same time, the farmers themselves had made great economic commitments that now they were caught with. <laughs> Their mortgage wasn't going down with the prices. Uh, the debts that they owed uh, were, not, were not disappearing. The taxes they were paying were not changing. At an earlier time, many of these same farmers have been the first ones eager to commit themselves to those taxes by passing bond issues to try to attract railroads into their town, for example, uh, by committing themselves to certain kinds of social and economic development that they thought would attract more settlement. But now, when the bad years came, they tended to turn on the railroads, the same railroads that they had tried to draw out onto the plants, uh, to turn on the bankers who were holding their mortgages that these farmers had signed, to turn on the governments that were imposing taxes. This resulted in a, a social and a political upheaval uh, on the Great Plains that was part of a larger feeling of discontent among other groups uh, in the United States uh, in the closing years of the 19th century. And yet, in just a few short decades, the West has become bound up in the economic interests of the nation. The people of the West are not always satisfied with their role in this equation, but they are nonetheless essential to it. The American West is becoming critical to capitalist development. It's seen as a place which supplies raw materials to the rest of the United States and will set in motion this boom-bust economy. The kinds of classic Western industries or late 19th century industries cattle ranching, um, timber production, 
in the Northwest. Mineral production outside of California, Idaho, and the Homestake Mine in South Dakota, all of these things, New Mexico, Arizona. Wheat farming, the great wheat boom as they move into the Dakotas and on into eastern Montana, eastern Colorado. All of these things basically supply raw goods, which will be refined and finished elsewhere. And Westerners begin to complain that they are being reduced to being hewers of wood and carriers of water for the larger economy. That in fact, the capital that's necessary for industrialization, for the, for the things that yield real wealth, go to the East. And there's going to be this constant complaint, which will show up in Western political movements, will show up in the West's demand that if private capital is not going to develop the West, then the government should develop the West. That they are being left out of these larger trends. But in fact, it's one of the things that happens in the West is that you can't understand the late 19th century West without understanding this larger world economy. We think of it as people in log cabins out in the middle of nowhere. But in fact, all of them are producing goods which are creating things which are going to be used all over the United States, on into Europe, into South America, beginning to penetrate the whole world economy. So the West is not some distant backwater. It's critical, but it sees itself as unequal and is colonized by the rest of the United States. The Unfinished Nation is a 52-part American history series. For more information about this program and accompanying materials, call 1-800-576-2988 or visit us online at www.intelecom.org.